Why don't we get started? I'm Edward Rock. I teach here at the law school, and I'm the director of the Institute for Corporate Governance and Finance, uh, which is sponsoring this conference. And it is also part of the Corporate Governance Seminar that Marty Lipton, Wendell Wilkie, and I teach together this semester. So this is, this is a class in addition to being a, a conference. Uh, the origin of this conference is a sense that many of us have had over the last few years that all of a sudden ESG concerns have gone from the province of activists to the mainstream. Uh, it first hit me when I was at a conference and heard the, the transformation of the ESG argument from the old, these are worthy goals that need to be per pursued to what struck me as an utterly different language, which was that ESG factors are risk factors. And any board that is doing its job needs to consider risk factors. Uh, and that move, that rhetorical move, brought, I think, ESG into the mainstream. Because as soon as it's put in terms of risk factors, corporate, traditional corporate law guys like me know how to think about it. It's, if it's a risk factor, then it's something that has to be taken into account. And that led me to start paying more attention. Of course, the fact that I hadn't been paying attention to ESG didn't mean that other people hadn't been paying attention to ESG. And it turns out there were a lot of people out there who uh, were, were far ahead of me in thinking through these issues. Uh, whether it be on the, on the issuer side, I hope you will get copies of the Hess Corporation Sustainability Report. Uh, John Hess is on, on our third panel, and they've been doing a sustainability report for, for ages. It's not the first time they've started thinking about <coughs> sustainability, even if it might be the first time I've started thinking about sustainability. Uh, and so the, the, the goal of the conference, I think, uh, sort of in a, in a sense, is to, f to allow mainstream corporate law people like me to start thinking about what we think about ESG and the role of ESG both on the board side and even more, I think, complicated on the, issue, on the investor side. Um, and we've pulled together three panels that are designed to elucidate various aspects of, of these issues. The first is a panel of academics, which we'll embark on in a moment, and I'll introduce folks in a moment. Then we're going to go to the folks who are charged with implementing uh, ESG mandates. Uh, or figuring out how to implement them, uh, both on the asset manager side, so we have Rocky Kumar from State Street and, and Michelle Edkins from BlackRock, as well as on the, uh, on the fund manager side uh, with Jana, with Charlie, Charlie Penner from Jana and Eva Zalotnika from, from Value Act. Uh, and then our third panel, as you know, will be the view from the firm leadership, both on the uh, investor side with both with uh, with Jeff Ubbin here from Value Act as well as on the asset manager side with Ron O'Hanley from State Street uh, on the the large asset manager side as well with Barbara Novick from uh, from BlackRock and on the issuer side and, and I'm really grateful to John Hess for being here because it seemed to me as I was thinking through and Marty and I were talking through the organization of the conference, that the single most difficult task in the, certainly in the environmental end of the ESG world, is what you do if you're running an oil company. You know, it's, it's uh, in, a, in an era in which people are worried about carbon in the atmosphere and carbon taxes. How do you deal with ESG issues if you are running an oil company? And John Hess has been thinking about this for a long time, and it's really great that he can be here to, uh, to help us think about it. Um, the first panel is, is to try to think about this conceptually through an academic lens. And our first speaker is going to be Bob Eccles, who has been worrying about these issues much longer than I have. Uh, and importantly, and I think extremely usefully, not as a lawyer. I mean, it's too easy for us to get into what the, the legal issues are before getting into what the, the business issues are, why uh, 
uh, ESG might be an opportunity from the business side, how it ties into management, how it ties into disclosure. Uh, after uh, Bob, we will then turn to Ron Gilson, who has taught me a huge amount about all sorts of things, but he has a paper with, uh, with Paul Brest and with Mark Wolfson on the possibilities of ESG through a finance lens. Uh, when, there's, when you can have non-concessionary ESG, when it's unlikely that that's going to be plausible. And conceptually, I think it's extremely valuable. And uh, after the conference, I will post the, the papers on the, uh, on the conference, the website, the ICDF web, website. We're then, gonna, we're then gonna turn to issues of fiduciary duty, both on the board side, but more interestingly and more importantly, on the investor side. Uh, and we're going to then, we're going to start with Janice Sarah, uh, who brings us a Canadian perspective. This is not just an American, a U.S. problem. This is an international set of issues. And Janice has been working on this in the, in the Canadian context and more generally in the comparative context and uh, has done some very interesting work and is working on a book that will take an in-depth look at these sets of issues. And then our final speaker will be Max Schatzenbach uh, from Northwestern, who, along with his co-author, Rob Sitkoff, uh, have a, a wonderful paper that's just been posted on SSRN on the fiduciary duty aspects on the investor side uh, of, of uh, ESG investment. And there's sort of two ways, to, I think, to, to, to think of this. One is, is on the board side, may boards consider ESG factors? And must boards consider ESG factors? Uh, we'll see that the speakers have differing views on this. And you can ask the same questions on the, on the investor side. And if so, what sort of limits are there? You need to be able to make a case that will survive scrutiny, that this will lead to higher long-term returns? Or is there a, a, less, a, a less demanding standard for justification? So with that, let me get out of the way and turn it over to Bob. And Bob, you can either speak from your chair or stand up. Podium as you stand up. I'll be setting most of the afternoon. So thanks, Ed, for the introduction. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an economist. I'm not a finance professor. Uh, I'm not an investor. I've never managed anything. To be honest, I'm the least qualified person to speak to this conference. I think Ed has me going first. I'm going to be like the warm-up act, right? <laughs> and then we're going to get to people that actually know something. Um, as Ed also knows, um, I'm a failed mathematician. When I was a student at MIT, I wanted to be a pure mathematician. And I turned 19 years old, and I hadn't proved a major theorem. So I said, Bob, it's time for a new line of work. And I ended up getting a PhD in sociology and somehow got invited to this August conference. So I'm looking forward to learning a lot from the panelists, from people here. What I'm going to do is three things. I'm going to give you sort of 50 years of history of sustainable investing, but it's not going to take that long. I'm going to give you a little case study of two ESG data vendors. And I'm going to tell you about two meetings I had in New York, one yesterday morning and one I just had this morning. So the 50 years of history, what Ed had asked me to do was to try and set the landscape for how we came to be where we are today. I think it can be traced back to the 60s and 70s with the activist movement. I'm a child of the 60s. To the extent I can remember anything from the 60s, I remember it pretty well. Um, what was it, Vietnam, Agent Orange, apartheid, munitions, and that fairly soon kind of crept into the socially responsible investing community. And there were small funds that got started, Trillium, Domini, and it was values-based investing. It was largely based on negative screening. The issue of whether you were giving up return was on the table from the beginning. People that were involved in that will tell you empirically it hasn't been shown clearly one way or the other on the investor side. It's different on the corporate side. So you had 
In the 70s and then going into the 80s, you had the emergence of still, and there's a lot of them around today, they're still fairly small. Domini, I think, is one or two billion dollars in assets under management. You had another phenomenon which is very interesting and important and a little arcane, is you started to see the emergence of so-called ESG data vendors. And that started to happen in the 80s and it went through the 90s. Some of the earliest ones were Vigio in France, Iris in the UK, uh, something called KLD Research and Analytics, which was affiliated with Domini in the beginning because they were trying to do responsible investing, but they needed to get the data and there wasn't any data, so they basically created a firm to provide the data that they could use in making the investment decisions. And so you saw a growth of this industry of ESG data vendors. Sustainalytics came in, MSCI came in, and now there's been a tremendous amount of consolidation in this really confusing space with MSCI being one of the big dogs. Uh, Morningstar bought 40% of Sustainalytics, that would be the second big dog, and then you've got ISS. So there's been a bunch of roll-ups, and there's some new types of data vendors that I'll talk about later. So that was going on kind of through the 80s, and the reason that they existed, in my view, is that companies weren't really reporting on sustainability, so how could investors get the data that they needed? And um, there was no requirements for them to do so. So they were basically, it was a market force to sort of fill a need for information that the investors wanted to get. Then starting in the 90s and going up until about, you know, 2015, so with, with the TCFD, you started to see the emergence of NGOs that were attempting to set standards for reporting on so-called non-financial information, ESG. The first one, the granddaddy, which many of you have probably heard of, is Global Reporting Initiative, GRI, started by some friends of mine. Uh, it was a remarkably ambitious thing. It was 1997 and they said, look, um, investors have got mechanisms to tell what they want to get um, from companies. It's called you know, FASB and ISB. What about all these other stakeholders out there? Who's serving their needs? Who's putting pressure on companies to give information to other stakeholders? So GRI was formed. They formed the GR guidelines. They're now on G4. And for the most part, it's a voluntary thing. Hess has got a sustainability report. I haven't had a chance to see if they use the GRI guidelines. Today, there's about 5,000 companies all over the world that are, for the most part, on a voluntary basis, reporting according to the GRI guidelines. There was a fundamental tension in the way GRI was formed in the view, and I've had the discussion with the guys who started it, because they're my friends, was we really wanted to make this a multiple stakeholder focus it wasn't a shareholder focus, and so then the question was, is the data that's being reported by companies using the GRI guidelines relevant to investors or not? The debate rages. That's the first sort of acronym in an alphabet soup that now includes CDP, which is the artist formerly known as the Carbon Disclosure Project, the Carbon Disclosure Standards Board, the International Integrated Reporting Council, which I was involved in starting, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, which I was the founding chairman of, and then you have the TCFD, so you've got this welter of confusion of basically NGOs that are attempting to establish standards and frameworks for companies to report and to have information, just like with accounting information, which we take for granted, so that it's comparable, at least within an industry across companies. SASB is very investor focused. They say we use the SEC's definition of materiality, this information should go into the 10K, GRI has a different view, but you've got this kind of welter of basically, as I said, NGOs that are attempting to set these standards. Um, getting into the 2000s, four or five years ago, you started to see more academic research being done on the relationship between non-financial or ESG performance and financial performance. I've written a paper. Uh, I think some of the best empirical work is being done by a professor named George Seraphim at Harvard Business School. And so there are regressions, there are correlations, they're not causation, but it's pretty persuasive that basically companies that are doing a good job of managing the material ESG issues for their sector, and it's very sector specific, you know, access to medicine is not material for a bank or for an oil company, it is for a pharmaceutical company. What you'll see is that over time, and the overtime is important, the lag seems to be six to seven years, their financial performance measured in terms of stock price returns or accounting returns tends to be superior. So you've got this growing body of persuasive empirical research on the company side. The best work done on the investor side, I think, is being done by a professor named Rob Bauer at Maastricht University in Amsterdam. He's trying to look at it from the investor side. And, and basically, it's like too close to call. 
I mean, there's data issues, there's methodological issues. They try and match up sort of a general fund with an SRI fund and kind of see how they compare. Uh, I'm involved in a project with the World Bank that's going to lead to this G20 Investor Forum, which I won't get into. Uh, it involved interviewing CEOs and CIOs of 34 big asset owners and asset managers all over the world, big names that you would all know. It was interesting. The consensus was pretty clear on a number of topics. From their point of view, the question is over about whether sustainable investing is value creating. All right? They're now thinking about, OK, now how do we sort of get this implemented deeper down into our organization so it's not just an ESG group, but it's the portfolio managers who are taking a view on materiality. And there's some interesting things that are going on. Um, in 2015, the Sustainable Development Goals are ratified by the UN. You can't go to a conference of investors and not hear talk about the SDGs. It's really interesting to see what impact, pun intended, that this has had in the mainstream community because it's taken the language, Ron and I talked about this a little bit at lunch, of impact and impact investing into the public markets, which has traditionally been kind of private markets with very strict, I read a nice paper that Ron wrote, you know, you've got to have additionality, you've got to have additionality, we're going to have some people from hedge funds. Hedge funds, I mean, talk about mainstream, right? When the barbarians at the gate, and I'm involved with one of these barbarians, when they think that there's value that can be created in improving the environmental and social performance of a company, then something's clearly going on. Um, so today we've gone from ESG, certainly from a risk point of view. Maybe you do it right and you can kind of find signals that a company's ESG performance is going to be improving and that's going to be a signal and you figure it out before somebody else does to lead to superior financial performance. ESG metrics are basically outcomes of companies. Impact metrics are externalities that are being created in the world by companies. So they're different things. And kind of that's what the state of play is today. The quick little case study I want to give you, as I said, there was all these different firms. There's been this value versus values tension from the beginning. Uh, one of the first firms I mentioned, KLD Research and Analytics, they had a values-based approach, and I won't get into the methodology. Another company called Invest <laughs> was more value-based. They're focused with investors. Both were acquired by RepRisk, which was then acquired by MSCI. I read a paper with someone at MSCI on this. What they wanted to do was take the best of both worlds between these two different data vendors, and they found they couldn't do so, that the initial framing was so different, the way they thought about the world was so different that they had to pick. So they picked Innovest, but the data that's available to the academic community for its research is KLD. So there's a very interesting kind of set of questions there. I wrote a paper with some colleagues called Exploring Social Origins in the Construction of ESG Measures. And when you look at how these firms were started, Oi Common Journey, Geo in France, you know, Iris in the UK, you can see this DNA stamp that got put in based upon kind of the framing and the view they had of what ESG means. And you've got this big linguistic debate, ESG, impact, sustainable investing, and I think we still haven't sorted that out. Real quickly, my two meetings. So the meeting I had yesterday was the kickoff of something called the Impact Management Project. Uh, it's going into phase three. It was started under Bridges Management, Bridges Ventures over in the UK. What they're attempting to do is pull together all of these different organizations, PRI and GRI and UNDP and OPEC and IFC and GIN, and there's like nine or 10, and create some common language some common frameworks about how to think about impact measurement, impact management, and impact investing. And they're trying to bring together three really different tribes. You've got the tribe that Ron knows well with his colleagues. Um, there's the tribe that I live in more, which is kind of the public markets. And then you've got the kind of multilateral development banks and the DFI tribes. They're all saying sustainable investing, impact investing, they kind of mean the same thing, not exactly the same thing. So, this group is trying to sort out this alphabet suit of acronyms, which is creating tremendous confusion in the part of both the corporate and the investment community, who all kind of want to move in this direction, but they don't have like the clear tools in their view to do it like we have clear tools or the counting standards. Last story. This morning I had a meeting with the CIO of the UN Pension Fund, who I met through this conference in Toronto. There's something called the International Center for Pension Management at the Rotman School. 
which has brought together 40 of the biggest pension funds around the world to do essentially research. They're interesting because they're part of the UN, and it's the UN that has the sustainable development goals, and there's this big push for, you know, how can investors contribute to the sustainable development goals? Because another major thing that's changed, I should have mentioned, is this increasing interest in a system level <coughs> view of the state of the world. So climate change is changing the state of the world. Social inequality is changing the state of the world. The big asset owners, big asset managers say, we can't diversify away from that. So we need to think about our investments. Are they doing good things or bad things to change the state of the world? But at the same time, we still have a fiduciary duty, and the whole fiduciary duty question is fascinating, and we'll get into it, because we have experts. Um, they still have to earn a return. So the UN pension fund is obviously separate. They have a fiduciary duty to maximize return. Um, I did a little study mapping SASB's material issues for the 79 industries to the targets of the SDGs. They've taken that much, much further with a lot of empirical analysis using this blender approach for data sources. And so we're working on a paper, and what it will show is that, and the mathematics is a little bit complicated, but that it's possible to construct portfolios where you're keeping alpha constant for a given level of risk that you're able to take, but you can tweak these portfolios both in terms of ESG, performance of the companies, but also tweak them in terms of impact. And I think making this connection between financial performance and ESG performance has been pretty well demonstrated. The frontier is now thinking about can you show a relationship between financial performance and impact and can we agree upon what impact means? So thank you. Thank you, Bob. Rod? Well, my first trick was not falling off the podium. Um, and uh, so I'm one in a row. Uh, the, um, what I want to talk about in my, uh, in my 12 minutes is the vocabulary. Because one of the things that I've experienced, and I'm, I'm going to I'm going to approach it from an asset management side, where I spend a little bit of time, um, people talk about use the same language to talk about different things, and the conversation typically goes past goes past each other. So I thought one contribution I could make in going forward is to be really clear about the issues that ESG investing confront and a way in which we could engage. So I'm going to start by making one significant distinction. I don't want to talk about ESG investing, because at, at a very simple level, it's at least two different things. On the one hand, it's value investment, on the other, or investment based on values, and on the other, it's impact investment, where we imagine our investment is going to have an impact. Now, this is a distinction that for years, large, uh, large um, uh, foundations didn't draw. They treated their, uh, their portfolio management and their project management as being acoustically separated. Project portfolio management was simply to generate resources which the, uh, the project side could do, and if it meant that you were digging out of a hole, didn't make much difference. So what we've observed is people genuinely care about it. You know, there's a, there are lots of studies. The most recent one I've seen is uh, of millennials, however that's defined, but 71% are willing to pay something to have their, their portfolio decisions reflect their personal values. Perfectly sensible thing to do. The distinction I want to draw is between value, uh, value investment on the one hand uh, and impact investment on the other. And for impact investment, I mean social value creation. And I have a very straightforward definition of it. As a result of your investment, there needs to be more of whatever good thing you think is important than there would have been without your investment. It's really straightforward. You've got to show causation. The term is used astonishingly loosely, in part by really good people who deeply believe in it, who want this to happen. 
and a result resist precision because it may be hard to do. On the other, if there is a lot of money flowing into active asset management in an ESG setting, um, the sell side, it's, there's going to be a bunch of investment that's going to be sold rather than bought. And if you actually read the marketing material uh, for uh, large funds, um, impact investing appears frequently. I'm going to come back to the notion about whether um, one can do it. One, there's a plausible story in which impact investment can be done through public market securities. Second point, uh, the third point is to distinguish between concessionary uh, and non-concessionary uh, investment. That is, is it costly to achieve uh, either value alignment or impact investment as to the extent that it's possible? What do we give up? Uh, what do we give up in return uh, for uh, doing it? So, the, um, here's the, it, drawing the distinction I just suggested um, leads you, I think, to three questions. First question, as I suggested, is can investments in secondary markets create social value? That is, if we invest in publicly held securities, however, through whatever, through whatever vehicle, am I actually going to be, to be able to identify a portfolio, portfolio decisions that will cause there to be more of whatever particular value I think is important? Uh, I'm going to suggest to you that, uh, at least as a, um, as a starting point, that the short answer is no. That if one works through arbitrage, um, if, one, if one works through an arbitrage mechanism, um, clientele effects will arbitrage away uh, whatever um, whatever value uh, was associated with it. Now, that's not a reason not to do it. The reason to do value investment is because of the values that you hold. It's important to be serious about what the cost of those values are, what you give up in terms of diversification, what your values actually are, and I'll give you an, a, an example. Uh, Stanford University, uh, where I spent some time, uh, decided to divest from fossil fuels. A colleague of mine at Columbia, Patrick Bolton, a superb financial economist, built a portfolio management model, which he gives away rather than sells. There are a couple of the large Swedish pension funds who are using him using them where what he measures is the carbon footprint of your portfolio. And using the techniques, the claim is he can reduce the carbon footprint of your portfolio by 40% with, with zero backwards testing tracking error. And just in case, the effect is to give you an option on climate change regulation because your light, uh, your, your, the lightness of your carbon foot, uh, footprint means you do well when there's additional, uh, when there's additional, uh, uh, additional regulation. My point is that um, fossil fuel div div uh, divestment is a little bit, keep staying with my Stanford example, of letting 19-year-olds make portfolio decisions. Determining what your values are and how to go about it um, requires care, thought, and the kind of work uh, that Bob, uh, the kind of work uh, that Bob has been doing. Um, the second issue is, if impact, if you can't do impact investing at a private, it, it, through public markets, what about private equity? That is, lots of smart people. They can specialize in industries and approaches. Um, at least there will be a little short selling, there will be a little way to arbitrage. Conceptually, it's a plausible story. Um, it's my sense of where the, real, where the real debate is, and I'll leave you with, uh, with a question, which is one, it's a, a very competitive industry with very smart people chasing a fair amount of money. 
One of the things that you can see that isn't being done right from my, from my observation is that the contractual structure of the standard private equity arrangement, 2% 20, um, has worked its way into most of the, private, uh, of the uh, uh, impact investment private equity funds. And by that I mean, um, uh, Bang Tolstrom won the Nobel Prize for an intuition that all of our grandmothers would have had. That is, if you want two things, but you can only measure one, you're only going to get the one you measure. By and large, with the, the, with the exception of a handful of small funds, the 20% is only of financial gain. The payoff to the general partner is not based on impact. That's, part of it is because it's very difficult to measure. It requires either a very carefully uh, done set of arrangements that are going to be peculiar to the investor, not just to the fund, uh, and, um, uh, and the capacity after the fact to see where it works. Where you have seen them is getting pushed to areas where the impact that, you th that you're seeking is very easy to measure. So for example, I can do the 220 with a second factor if what I'm measuring is an increase in the distribution of mosquito netting, because I can count it. Once I begin doing things that are more complex, the getting the incentive straight uh, in, uh, in a standard private equity uh, setting is uh, difficult. Uh, and I'm going to close with the third question. You know, first was, can we do uh, impact investing through uh, public markets? The second was, how do we approach it in private markets? Uh, the third is, um, can the power of stakeholders potentially create value? And we'll have a session on that. We'll have a session on that today. Uh, we're beginning to see a shift in the way large, um, large institutions are voting, and we'll have the opportunity to listen to people, where it is plausible that, um, that one can have an impact, provided that we can carefully identify what values we're trying to produce and uh, we can measure them. But my point is, what I'd like you to walk away with is just talking about ESG investment is too general to identify what, the, what strategy you actually want when you, met, when you decide how to invest yourself. That it can't sustain impact investing. That impact investing is narrow because you've got to show, measure that you have an impact, which can't be done through uh, private markets and the contracting associated with it is difficult. It can't just be lifted from the, sta from the standard private equity model that we've had um, uh, for years. And the third is the concentration of ownership in financial intermediaries makes, provides an opportunity for stakeholders to actually have an impact. Whether that's a good thing or not, I'll leave to other people, but it's plausible now in a way that it hadn't been before. Thank you, Rod. Uh, Bob, I just want to get you back into the conversation, get you into the conversation. What, what's the current state of the data in terms of measuring the impact of impact investment uh, and the social value creation? Can we measure it? And if so, you know, who's, who's at the cutting edge of trying to measure this? So I think um, if you distinguish between, you know, kind of the peers definition that Ron gave, I think in, in the situation, Ron, that you're talking about, these are very bespoke measures, and I think you can come up with measures that are pretty good, right? Because you haven't made the investment unless you've said we can measure this. And so, you know, there'll be things that are kind of private, and really gin through IRIS, this Global Impact Investing Network mm -hmm. has tried to develop it. Um, leaving aside the question about can you be doing impact investing in the public markets, which will have you know, some people on a panel, um, that's the frontier. People would say, there's no, just like there's no standards for ESG, maybe it's GRI, maybe it's SASB, you know, what this impact management project is hoping to do is to come up with at least frameworks in common language, maybe impact measures. There's another angle on this, though, which is in the last year, I keep bumping into these little AI big data firms, 
right? And they're all doing things slightly differently. There's a group <coughs> called UTIL in Oxford. There's a group called Prisma in Stockholm. And they are saying that they can measure impact. They're saying they go and they grab all these public available data. They'll grab data from the companies. They'll put it in a machine. They'll have people a lot smarter than me, who probably could have been pure mathematicians, analyze it, do the algorithm. And they say they can come out with dollar measures of the positive and negative impact of a public company's products and services, and in the one case, do it through the lens of the SDGs. Whether they can really do that or not, don't know, right? As I said, they're kind of new and they're starting. But I think a factor that we need to think about, and I know this is going on in some of the big asset managers, including one that's gonna be here today. Um, if you go talk to people at, let's just say BlackRock, and say, what do you think of company reporting? They'll say, eh, it's not that good still. Doesn't matter, we've got a lot of other ways to gather data. So unlike those times in the 80s and the 90s I was talking about when the MSCI is created, there's potentially a whole disruptive approach coming into how you'd measure, whether it's ESG or it's, whether it's impact based upon essentially artificial intelligence and big data. And do you know of any private equity firms that are incentivizing the general partner on impact measures in addition to financial measures? I don't know of a single one. I don't know of a single one. Interesting. I, I want to now turn to, to, to Janice. I think the next, one way to frame the next uh, discussion is using Ron's vocabulary and to think about from the board perspective, may a board take, may a board, for instance, choose non-concessionary value-based investments? That is to say, if you're not sacrificing returns, can you indulge or play to the va your values or the values of your shareholders? And then the companion question of whether a board and under what circumstances a board can consider concessionary impact investments. Uh, for those of us who do corporate law, I think we immediately have, have an intuition that both are probably within the discretion of the board. But then I think we want to ask exactly the same questions about the investor side. And in particular, may an ERISA trustee, an ERISA a trustee who is subject to ERISA duties, uh, make non-concessionary value-based investments or concessionary impact investments? And what about the fiduciaries who are not ERISA fiduciaries, but nonetheless have a fiduciary role. Let me turn it over to, to Janice to get us started on talking about the fiduciary <coughs> duty side. Okay, I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna speak from the floor, from the seat, primarily because I usually can't see over the podium. So it's just easier for you to see me and, and me to see you. And I really appreciate the invitation from Ed uh, to speak to you today and to bring an international perspective from Canada and elsewhere. And I think I want to start in respect to fiduciary obligation by um, noting the most, uh, the most distinguishable difference between uh, Canadian law and U.S. law. And that is that the U.S. corporate law has a very strong shareholder primacy norm. And it re it's reflected in your uh, case law pretty consistently. And Canada is actually quite different. So Canada, the obligation looks the same. It's to the directors and officers to act in the best interest of the corporation. But that's been consistently defined by our Supreme Court of Canada as the entire corporation and all of the stakeholders. And the Supreme Court has said on a number of occasions, reinforced very recently, uh, that in considering best interests, directors and officers really should think about um, all sorts of stakeholders, community members, employees, customers, creditors, shareholders, and that in addition to worrying about the economic sustainability of the company, should also think about how the company is acting as a good corporate citizen. So of course, that's its most recent proclamation, and what that means will, of course, be unpacked in the decisions to come. But it is a really different uh, framing point, I think, for thinking about fiduciary obligation and ESG. Um, we haven't had cases specifically on an issue like climate change, uh, but there's an argument to be made that, in fact, when one frames it that way, uh, that there is a fiduciary obligation, in fact, when considering the interests, best interests of the company, to at least put one's mind to whether there are r risks related to 
whether it's environmental, climate related, and other environmental, uh, social or governance issues. And then if there are risks, and they are significant, there's a debate about materiality going on in Canada, but it's significant, then um, what are the directors doing? Are they actually putting measures in place to address it? Are they uh, tasking managers to manage the problem? Are they uh, following up and monitoring? And what's the evaluation of those processes? So it's left an opening in Canada, I think, uh, and elsewhere, and elsewhere, I think, in the United Kingdom and France and other places. So I think that's the first thing to think about. The second is, in Canada, we have something called the oppression remedy under corporate law, which the UK also has. And I don't believe you have something like that here. And basically that says that um, directors and officers can be held personally liable for conduct that unfairly disregards the reasonable expectations of some named stakeholders. Shareholders are one of them, secured creditors are other. And unfairly disregarding, of course, is a fairly low threshold. It's not oppressive conduct. There are sort of three levels of oppression remedies. But unfairly disregards really means that directors and officers arguably have an obligation, again, to put their minds to some of these issues. And they may decide that they're not relevant for the particular business. But I think there's a leg there for potentially personal liability that, needs, that, that we'll see. And we've had cases where directors and officers have been personally liable for failure to uh, monitor environmental protection, for example. Um, finally, just on, on, just on the package of things, uh, of course, is securities disclosure law for publicly traded entities. Um, in Canada, our securities regulators um, have recently said, well, we think our current disclosure laws require you uh, to at least uh, disclose or explain. Um, I don't see it in the language of our securities law, and I think there's a lot of effort to actually put that in place. But it is a very live debate right now in Canada. Just turning for a second to the fiduciary obligation of pension fiduciaries, um, I notice there's a stark contrast between uh, what seems to be recently occurring in the United States under ERISA and our, the way in which our pension fiduciaries are treated. So you're probably aware of this U.S. Uh, Department of Labor um, uh, field assistant bulletin that came out this year that basically said, um, you know, that these pension fiduciaries cannot sacrifice returns to promote collateral ESG, whatever that means, um, and that they can't routinely incur expenses in the advocacy in terms of shareholder resolutions, proxy fights, et cetera. Um, to me, this is a very, a bit of a shocking bulletin and certainly runs counter to anything that we understand about pension fiduciaries in Canada. And I think that's because, um, not unlike the US, I would say, um, our obligation under both trust law and pension law in Canada is that pension fiduciaries are to act prudently uh, in the best interests of, um, of, of beneficiaries in making investment decisions regarding the fund portfolios. The difference, I would say, is that we've had strong acknowledgement, again, from the courts, that there's not a single beneficiary here, and that almost every pension plan has intergenerational beneficiaries. And therefore, when one, one doesn't, can't make the sort of bald short-term return long-term and return kinds of decisions because, in fact, it's much more nuanced than that, that there's a multi-generational interest, that the pension fund has an obligation to ensure that it's sustainable over the long term, and that its decisions, therefore, assuming that they're made reasonably and prudently, are not going to be second-guessed by the courts, even if they are active in uh, resolutions, proxy fights, etc. So it's a very different approach in Canada than uh, what appears to be some direction in the United States. And just to bring it out a little further, there's now seven countries that actually now require pension funds to publicly disclose the extent to which they incorporate ESG in their investment decisions. So what would a duty, fiduciary duty look like for ESG? I think, again, I could use the climate example because we have in Canada fairly rich case law about environmental fiduciary duty, and one can extrapolate from that. And here again, it's this idea, have you taken the steps to assess whether risk is material? Have you taken the steps to develop strategies? Uh, is it part of your strategic planning? Is it part of your uh, oversight and managing, and is it your part of your monitoring? And so those kinds of questions that can be asked, I think, will start to hone in on what the fiduciary obligation or the scope of the obligation would be. And I just want to note, for example, that there's, uh, as of last week, um, there are, there's an investor in the United Kingdom that has sent a notice to two firms, uh, en en Enigera, I think that's how you pronounce Energia, and Enia. Um, basically putting them on notice that they're going to bring a lawsuit as shareholders uh, for failure, for breach of fiduciary obligation because of their investment in a coal, um, in a coal uh, 
facility in Poland that everyone says is, going to, is not going to be sustainable economically ever. And so they put them on notice that they are going to bring litigation if they continue on the trajectory. So I think we're going to see the first cases, not only of the disclosure cases, which of course we've seen here in the US, but also in Australia, the UK, and other places, but I think we're going to see the first cases on fiduciary obligation. There was a reference made to, you know, who's doing what or who's actually putting this in effect as investors or pension funds in a meaningful way. And I just want to give you a Canadian example, uh, the Caste de Dépôt de Placement de, place, uh, de, de, de Québec, uh, which is um, basically manages $299 billion in net assets. And it's announced a very, it has a very comprehensive ESG program that announced in 2017, it had been doing work before then, but it actually started to put metrics uh, to everything that it was doing. Uh, so it has said it will reduce its carbon intensity of its portfolio by 25% in the next six years. It has actually developed metrics for measuring its, car its carbon footprint in terms of across the range of portfolios. It has uh, said it will ingre increase its green investment in the next two years by eight billion. And, uh, and interestingly and importantly, it is now measuring the performance, it's given a goal to each of its portfolio managers, and it is measuring them based on their meeting these targets, and it has said that their, their uh, pay will be based on meeting these goals. So it's the first example I've heard of where, in fact, performance to reach these uh, goals is uh, very much part of what, uh, what they're, how they're doing, how they're creating a paradigm shift within the investment decision making. They have another range of things, the number of women on boards, and they have a range of strategies that include um, supporting some shareholder proposals, but mostly direct intervention with boards of directors, and also this shifting in terms of their investment pat patterns. They are now doing for all new investments and all investments under review, full ESG evaluations. This year alone, it was about 200 of these evaluations, and they're engaging with boards or they're just choosing not to invest uh, based on these assessments, and they've got very public disclosures about some of this. And then to pull it back again internationally, um, it's interesting, uh, the UK uh, Companies Act now requires uh, that all publicly traded companies uh, disclose the extent to which they are taking account of ESG factors. Uh, so that's happening. In France, the Loi de Transition Energétique pour la Croissance Verte, that's basically the Green Clean Energy Act, uh, requires mandatory disclosure of companies on climate-related change, but, but much more um, detailed than anything you've seen elsewhere. So they have to not only annually disclose the financial risks related to the effects of climate change, but the company's measures to reduce them, including how they are implementing a low carbon strategy in every component of their activities. Also significantly, they are requiring institutional investors, not just pension plans, mutual funds, uh, all sorts of um, in institutional investors to do these mandatory disclosures for the first time. And that includes uh, disclosing how their investment decision making takes social, environmental, and governance criteria into consideration, and disclose how they are contributing to the energy and ecological transition to limit global warming. Um, that model has been in place uh, for two years, and the first reports are coming out. And you can see there's been a lot of activity uh, with being uh, holding holding uh, some of these investment funds accountable for the kind of failure to meet um, perhaps aspirational goals. Um, the e European Union is now working on similar language uh, to implement across the EU. Uh, so it is spreading as a sort of a, no a change, a change in the framework of sort of transparency of these measures. Um, there's also in the, United, in the European Union the CSR directive, which is now being implemented country by country. And here again, it's basically targeted at certain kinds of companies. I think it's 500 employees plus, plus uh, other kind of public interest entities, as they're called in the, in the directive. Uh, but here again is this notion of we need to find consistent metrics, we need to find consistent language, and we are going to measure this, and we are going to try and shift trajectory in the European Union. And then finally, I just want to talk a bit about the role of soft law initiatives, which I think everyone in this room will be familiar with. And of course, the most recent example is the Financial Stability Board's task force and climate-related financial disclosure. And of course, what's interesting is that, uh, to my knowledge, no government has actually adopted it yet. But a whole series of nations have now embraced it. And as of um, the status report that the TCFD sent, put out last week, uh, they now have 513 supporters 
and endorsers that are uh, of their recommendations, which again are trying to bring consistency in terms of what are the transition risks, what are the physical risks, um, how do you measure them, how do you quantify them, how do you disclose them. And um, those supporters now um, basically represent a combined market capitalization of $7.9 trillion US. So there is movement here, and I think it is a mix of sort of transparency, but also fiduciary obligation. And I see a forward trajectory, and I think that um, what that means uh, for all of us is that we need to rethink ways in which uh, we're um, looking at these measures, and certainly I see them as moving into the, very much the mainstream. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Uh, we're now going to turn to, to Max Schatzenbach. Uh, Max and his co-author, Rob Sitkoff, work on, on trust law. And for those of us who do corporate law, we, 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 we have our set of fiduciary duties that we spend lots of time teaching and thinking about. And they, they trace their origin to trust law and to agency law. But few of us know anything about trust law and agency law, except what we managed to cover in the basic corporations class. Uh, so let me turn it over to, to Max, who, who knows about this area of the law, and, and that's obviously the basis, the, the core basis for the, the, the duties that are imposed on, on pension fiduciaries and other fiduciaries on the investor side. Uh, thanks, Ed. So this is, this is definitely going to American law now, uh, and this may be something of a case of American exceptionalism, and maybe something we can talk more about in the questions. But what Robert Sickhoff and I do is we lay out the standards by which a fiduciary's use of ESG factors would be judged under canonical trust law, and then we clarify some misconceptions that have arisen around ESG, ESG investing by a fiduciary, at least in the US context. You may think, well, canonical trust law, how important is that? Are we talking about trust that you have for the benefit of children or, or a surviving spouse or something like that? And the answer is that uh, trust law fiduciary investment standards govern not just personal trust, but also charities and foundations and have been incorporated into ERISA standards, which means that uh, private pensions are also governed uh, by the same standards. And many states actually have uh, by statute or constitutional provisions required that the same standards apply to their state pension funds and other public pension funds. So the genesis of this project was uh, an approach from us from actually federated investors uh, who asked Rob and I to take a look at this and produce a white paper. They, they came to us saying that there's a group called the Principles for Responsible Investing. It's a United Nations uh, NGO that's uh, trying to get signatories. They're thinking about signing it. But they look out in, in the literature and what they see is a lot of people are saying, based on survey evidence of investors that we can't consider ESG factors in the United States because it, it impinges, it, it, it implicates the duty of loyalty. Uh, and then there's the PRI and others, some American academics who've argued that uh, ESG investing is so common and so prevalent uh, and so well embedded now that in fact it's a breach of your fiduciary duty of care uh, not to consider ESG factors, uh, and in fact, perhaps ESG investing is becoming mandatory for fiduciary investors uh, because it is so prevalent and, and so well established and so well documented. And so these are the arguments that were out there. Uh, and Rob and I uh, believe that both groups are in fact wrong. Uh, and they're wrong in a very uh, nuanced way, and so I'll try to, uh, I'll try to lay it out for you uh, here. But the misconception of those who strongly uh, so actually, let me start by actually describing what is different about trust fiduciary law relative to corporate law. So, you know, we have the traditional standards of loyalty and care, uh, but they're very, they're implemented in very different ways, and the substantive law that governs them are very different under trust law. So the duty of loyalty and trust law is the sole interest standard or the exclusive benefit standard. Uh, it, there is no defense as there, in, as, as there is in corporate law that it's in the best interests of the corporation, or that even though it's a conflicted transaction, it's fair. You don't have those fairness defenses. And it's implemented in trust law under something called the no further inquiry rule, which says that the beneficiaries merely have to demonstrate that the trustee acted under a conflict. They don't have to demonstrate injury. They don't have to demonstrate that it was unfair. And once they demonstrate that the trustee acted under a conflict, you're in breach. And the damages are rescission or actual harm. Okay. And then we have the duty of care. Uh, which is also much stricter in uh, trust law. It's, it's uh, in the investment function in trust law, we say that the duty, fiduciary duty is the duty of prudence. 
Uh, and it is something of a negligence standard. What, a, what would a reasonable person be doing in these situations, and have they documented and justified uh, their particular approach? There is no business judgment rule that protects a trustee. Uh, so there is no resort to uh, uh, some type of uh, shielding device uh, that can stop litigation or get rid of it at the pleading stage or, or what have you. And in fact, if some of you are familiar with Schlensky versus Wrigley, which is a famous corporate law case involving night baseball, shareholders complained that the Cubs weren't having night baseball, the court says get lost, uh, it's a corporation, it's a business decision, they get to make that. I think that if that was a trustee, the, the trustee would likely have lost that case. There would have been a substantive review of the trustee's decision, there would have been a searching review of the procedures the trustee used to arrive at that decision, and probably the trustee is going to be found to be wanting. You know, maybe not, maybe they could have produced some evidence that, uh, that what they were doing had uh, a basis to benefit the beneficiaries, but uh, likely they would, they would lose in that context. So, okay, so what do we do? We take these two fiduciary standards, and Rob and I conclude, and, and this is capsule summary, that ESG investing is no different than any other category of active investing. If a trustee has undertaken an ESG investment program solely to benefit the beneficiaries by producing better risk-adjusted returns for the beneficiaries and was solely motivated by that goal, then the trustee may proceed with the investment program. Full stop. So we should analyze it like we would analyze any other active investment program. And so Rob and I develop a taxonomy that we think is helpful, uh, where we say there's collateral benefits, ESG, which is ESG that has motive, is its motivation, the desire to provide collateral benefits to third parties, and then there's risk return ESG, which is ESG that's motivated by improving the portfolio performance. And so in the first instance, as a general matter, and I'll get to some exceptions, you simply can't do it. The sole interest rule governs and you cannot have collateral benefits ESG. You cannot pursue a collateral benefits ESG approach. Uh, under the risk return ESG, just, go ahead. Just jump in. And that's even if it's non-concessionary, uh, I'm using Rob's, uh, Ron's language. Yeah. Um, because it's a breach of the duty of loyalty. It would be, it, because, it's, because it's a sole interest standard, you don't have to prove any harm. So yes, so just the fact that you did it would be a breach. Now, maybe you can't show damages, right? But there are other remedies. You could remove the trustee, potentially, right? Uh, and, and so the burden entirely shifts to the trustee in that instance. Uh, so that's, yes, that's an important point. Um, uh, so then the, the risk return <laughs> ESG is evaluated the same way we would evaluate prudence, which is, did the trustee you know, in a cost-sensitive way, undertake a rational investment program for which it has documented its approach. It's going to be somewhat of a process review, but there's still some substantive review associated with it. And if the investor, investment fiduciary, uh, reasonably concludes that that would produce risk-adjusted returns, that that would improve the portfolio performance, that it matches the beneficiary's needs, the trustee can proceed uh, with that investment approach. Okay. And so we have another part of the paper where we ask, you know, how likely is, is this to be and, and uh, can it be mandatory? And so we take what we think is a more sober assessment of the ESG investment literature. And I think I completely agree with, with Robert Eccles, which is that, you know, the, the idea that ESG can produce firm value or improve firm value, particularly governance. I mean, how can governance not affect firm value, right, is, is pretty well established. You need another step, though, before you can say that investors, particularly trading in public markets, can benefit from ESG investment approaches, at least financially, right? Which is that the market has to have mispriced this, okay? And so uh, we think that, again, that's just an active investing question, and it's a similar, and it's no different than whether you're value investing or contrarian investing or doing any of these other different approaches, and it, and it can't be mandatory, and it can't be mandatory for a couple of reasons, one of which we don't have an agreed upon definition of what ESG is. There was a great article in the Wall Street Journal the other day that said Tesla scores number one in some, uh, 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 some approaches to ESG evaluation and it scores in the bottom quartile in others because it depends on how you rate their use of energy. Is it the end product or is it their inputs? Well, their inputs are actually have a high carbon uh, footprint and they also have governance issues, right? So there's a lot of disagreement about what ESG is 
and it can't be mandatory. But there's another reason it can't be mandatory, which is that the duty of prudence, the, the reforms that were implemented in the 1980s in the United States were an attempt to liberate trustees. We say that there's no investment and no investment program that is automatically prohibited or automatically required. The trustee has to take a reasonable approach. And as information comes in on finance and markets and investment techniques change, so can the trustee change. Uh, a, a, a real strict ESG requirement would say that passive investing uh, may not be allowed, that technical investing may not be allowed, or that contrarian investing may not be allowed, right? And all of those approaches, I think, can, don't if so facto, but can satisfy the prudence standard and is implemented by trustees in a careful fashion, usually do, okay? Um, and so we go on then to talk a little bit about the issues in charity and beneficiary authorization and settler authorization, which bring back in the possibility of using collateral benefits ESG. So one issue is, if there's a charitable purpose in mind, then perhaps collateral benefits ESG ought to be permitted on the grounds that it's consistent with the charitable purpose. And in that case, it is actually, if it's tied to the beneficiary's interests, the investment program is actually benefiting the beneficiaries, right? And this is a longstanding uh, exception, or understanding, I should say, in, in the charitable law of trust. We're not going to make the Sierra Club by Exxon, we're not gonna make the Catholic Church uh, invest in abortion facilities, right? We understand that that's tied to its charitable purpose, and Rob and I actually uh, offer as a legal innovation, and this is a normative argument we make, which is that we should evaluate the investment strategies along these lines as to whether or not a distribution of the same amount would have been permitted for the same purpose. So if it is damaging portfolio efficiency or if you are giving up returns or taking on more risk, can you quantify that risk and say, you know, uh, it's damaging the portfolio by between one and five million dollars, okay? And you could have made a distribution of that same amount for those beneficiaries. Rob and I would say, then we would say, Rob and I conclude that you would then permit that investment strategy, but you would tie it back to whether or not you could actually have made such a distribution in those circumstances. And so you could do this for a variety of charities. Beneficiary and settler authorization is a somewhat more complicated, uh, is a somewhat more complicated question, but it does expand the opportunities for a trustee to engage in ESG investing, the exception, or really the problem, is with pension funds, because there is no uh, beneficiary or settler authorization that we're aware of that's permitted in pension funds. And there's really no way to obtain beneficiary consent that, again, without some legal reform, uh, that we're aware of in those contexts. So I think to sum up the paper, in, in the interest of time and keeping an open discussion, is that we, we definitely push back against the zeitgeist uh, that's going on in favor of ESG investing. Uh, by a fiduciary. On the other hand, we also point out <laughs> that there's this sort of hangover from the 70s and 1980s where this, was, where, where this type of investing was about social responsible investing and, and, uh, and ethics, and some investors seem to be dodging it, simply fiduciary investors seem to be dodging it on the grounds that it breaches the duty of loyalty. It, it certainly doesn't have to, and they shouldn't avoid it on those grounds. They should approach it like they would approach any other active investing strategy. Thank you, Max. Uh, let me just turn back to Janice for a second. Janice, you, you indicated that under Canadian trust law, the standard is the best interest standard, not the sole interest it, standard. Right. So it's, so it's a... Is there a history to that? Did it, did it used to be the sole interest standard and it got changed? Was it changed by court decision, use, by, by legislation? Be, it, we, you know, we inherited British case law. Um, and uh, basically it was a sole interest. And then there was a shift in recent years because really the courts felt that it was um, uh, not in keeping with the general way in which trust law was developing in Canada, both under sort of statutory trust law but also statutory common law. I mean, I was curious when I was listening to Max, I'm thinking about the US pension funds that are actually very vocal on the issue of ESG and wondering, uh, based on your analysis, I, I, I'm not aware of anybody ever taking them on in terms of um, some of, if, at least their normative adoption of these measures, whether, you know, and trying to shift their trajectory, and whether or not it creates some lack of transparency if, in fact, they have to pigeonhole themselves in that the sole reason for using ESG is a sort of return mm -hmm. on investment, and does that create, in some senses, a lack of transparency about really what's driving them, which is partly a normative commitment. 
Um, so I, I would we cite uh, Kelper's uh, uh, publication in our paper that's really informative because they they say I'm almost quoting. Uh, we do not engage in ESG investing to save the world. We are doing it solely to benefit the beneficiaries. And so I, I think that, that trust uh, fiduciaries governed by trust law are pretty sensitive to the sole interest standard. You can actually look at the Stanford divestment um, uh, statement, and actually I think it's pretty consistent with the sole interest standard as well, even though Stanford is you know, a, a foundation and there's a lot of standing issues about actually enforcing some of the stuff against, against a charity. It'd largely be left to the AGs, uh, is my understanding. And so. Uh, you actually see a pretty good sensitivity to this issue, but are they, are they fig leafing it is a question. Are they sort of covering it up by saying that we think it can make money? I actually think that the law, because, because this is where the duty of prudence becomes operative, because prudence requires that you do a documented analysis where you say that, this is, that you're taking this approach for, for the following reasons and you believe it's correct for the following reasons. And so ESG right now has some evidence in its favor. Okay, that could change. There's a whole history of, asset, of the asset pricing literature from finance not enduring, right? That it reverts, it changes, it's not, it's not persistent. And so when that happens, you're going, to be, you're going to wind up with these internal, the numbers are what they're going to be. You're going to wind up with these internal reports saying, you can't make money off of ESG anymore. You used to be able to, or our approach was making money, and now it isn't. Maybe we have to find a new ESG approach. But that's actually what you're going to see. There's, a, there's an interesting uh, uh, study that Bessemer put out. It's public. It's cited in our paper, where they actually looked at their investment strategies, and they tried to marry ESG to it. And all of their non-ESG strategies were superior. I don't think it was by a statistically significant amount. But that was, that was the conclusion of their paper. And you look at that, and you think of Bessemer, and you think, well, can you, can you actually take those non-ESG strategies? Maybe you can by saying we think they're going to be lower risk and we haven't fully assessed risk, and so there's definitely subjectivity and wiggle room. But the fact that you have to run the numbers and rely on uh, or rely on the numbers other people have run means that there is some objectivity introduced into this through the prudent standard. And so I don't think you can really undertake a collateral benefits ESG program consistently and meet, satisfy your duty of prudence. When it changes, I, I want to get Ron into the conversation. Can, but I, if, can I just, yeah. just before you do right. that, I just want to, um, just to finish the answer. Yeah. I, I think the prudential inquiry is not that different in terms of making sure you have actually done the inquiry and made the decision. I think the nuanced difference, if I can explain it, is this really this idea that because of the intergenerational interests of the beneficiaries, it's not a straight mathematical equation, and therefore it does create some discretionary room that perhaps isn't available under U.S. trust law. Ron? Um, so there, there are a group of, a uh, small group of law firms who are making, I think, a reasonable living uh, settling cases brought against uh, ERISA trustees uh, for the selection of the funds, of the mutual funds that are on their platforms. Uh, and while they keep, on the one hand, they seem to keep losing what in reported cases, um, they're settling stuff um, for an amount that's um, significant. What I wanted to push a little bit about is about how much space there actually is between a business judgment rule on the one hand and, uh, uh, and the fiduciary standard under ERISA. So I've got, uh, I'm, I'm an, ERISA stand, uh, an ERISA trustee, um, I can basically uh, I can basically put uh, some uh, essentially zero uh, zero management fee index funds onto my platform. And let's what is, and I'm going to put some other funds on the platform, and they'll have a different one year, three year, five year, ten year response. But some of them will compare badly to a zero fee um, uh, to a zero fee. Um, uh, index fund. How much flexibility do I have? That is, are there circumstances where if, if, the fa if I make the facts up uh, and essentially there's, uh, uh, there are uh, actively managed funds on the platform that underperform net of fees, a, uh, a zero fee uh, uh, index funds, how does it come out? Uh, I, I think the ERISA trustee would typically win, okay? But the ERISA trustee is going to need a reason, well, and, a, and, a, and a real reason, not something made up, about why they're holding on to an underperforming fund, right? So 
One of them might be, we think, that these funds, uh, that active management does better at managing risk, and that that's not fully reflected uh, in the historical returns, and that there is some evidence that active management can uh, affect risk. They can also rely on the negligence standard to some degree, which is that a lot of other people are in active investing. Indeed, Harvard's endowments actively investing, and what Harvard's doing it cannot be imprudent, uh, likely. <laughs> Um, under a its... lot of money in 2010. <laughs> well, that, that doesn't say they can't make mistakes. It's got to be an ex-Andy ex analysis. But uh, the, the, the investment management strategies of most large endowments and most sophisticated investors, which often contain an active element, is just not going to be imprudent. So, but, but holding on to a mutual fund that's been consistently unperforming and has not changed management can and will result in liability at some point. And so holding, holding to an ESG strategy that hasn't been making money for a long time, I think puts you at litigation risk. So it's not zero cost. So it is, it is different than the BJR. So, so those of us in the corporate world, when the DOL bulletin came out, thought it was kind of nuts. But what you're telling us, if I'm not mistaken, is that as a statement of the risk of fiduciary duties, it's actually probably correct. Yeah, we, we don't have, Rob and I don't have a big disagreement with what the, remember there's actually five DOL bulletins, mm -hmm. right? I think two were under Obama, mm -hmm. one was under Bush, there's a new one under Trump, maybe there's four. I can't count, I can't keep track. They all say the same thing. There's some nuance in sort of maybe whether or not they say, well, if it's a tie, you can, you can, you can use an ESG factor as a tiebreaker or a collateral benefit as a tiebreaker. But they're actually, they actually have a fair cons you know, amount of consistency across the, the bulletins. So, uh, and if you read the literature of the well-advised funds, people like CalPERS, they're very careful uh, to speak in the language of sole interest. So, so one question for the future of ESG investing, I want to get Bob back in here, is do we need to change the law from the sole interest standard to the best interest standard in order to, if we want to encourage fiduciaries to invest with an ESG I, to what extent is the sole interest standard, as, as Max describes it, going to be a constraint? Because I take it under the sole interest standard, non-concessionary value-based investing is not permitted under the duty of loyalty unless you have the charitable situation. That concessionary impact investing is a breach of the duty of loyalty and the duty of prudence. Uh, and certainly if you can do what you call risk return ESG, if you have a reason and it persists, you can, but the, these other sorts of approaches are problematic. Bob, where do you, if, if the law is as Max, as I interpret Max as saying it is, is this a problem for the ESG world sufficient that, that we should think about changing the law? So I've never been to a law school class, but now I know what law school professors do. You pick out the weakest person in the class. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got four lawyers here, and then you ask me after they've opined, you know, in great depth on this topic to have an opinion. But, you know, I'm happy to do so because I'm a sociologist and we don't really care what people think. Um, I think this is almost a complete non-issue, right? And Max's point about there's this overlay still. So there's law and there's ideology. And you get it in fiduciary duty on both counts, right? The nuances that this panel is talking about, most people don't understand. Um, but it doesn't matter because all the big asset owners and asset managers I do say, look, sustainable investing, obviously we're doing this for return. We've got smart people. We're pushing this down to the portfolio manager level. We're not trying to give up returns to get impact. There's nothing concessionary about it at all. Um, leave the language alone of value investing, you know, kind of maybe drop socially responsible investing because people say sustainable investing and it kind of evokes, you know, what these terms meant in the past. So, you know, there was some hue and cry when this latest, you know, ERISA bulletin came out and I read it the best I could. I didn't see, you know, people in practice getting real bent out of shape about it, to tell you the truth. I think. The most complicated issue for me, and, and I'd love to talk to Max about this at some point, is what happens if you've said, look, we can show you that we've done ESG integration, although data's a problem. I mean, these rating agencies don't agree with each other. Everybody knows mm -hmm. that. Rocky knows that. Um, but we were very careful. We took it into account. We were doing it for returns. We had a certain time horizon, a certain risk level. But then we tweaked it 
for impact, right? Then we tweaked it for impact. We thought everything was constant. We didn't give up any alpha, but then we tilted it for impact, you know, which is they're talking about at the pension fund. How, how would that play, right? They, and, and they can give a really credible case. They've done very sophisticated analysis, and they said, then on top of it, we tweaked it for impact, which is basically doing good in the world. You've breached. That would be a breach. I'd be a breach. You okay. considered, you considered a, a collateral interest. Right. So I'm just, simply I'm just considering reporting, the collateral interest. Considering the collateral interest is a breach. I'm just, reporting, I'm just reporting the facts. I mean, that's, as I yeah. describe the positive yeah. law, that, that is a breach. And I think the DOL takes a position that that would be a breach. Okay. And that's the place where the newest DOL resolution, from, I think from a counseling perspective, but there are people in the room who are better at it than I am, the tiebreaker the ability to use it as a tiebreaker <coughs> allows you to make a case where here's the range of statistical significance. It's pretty large, so the tiebreaker space goes up. Taking that flexibility out of the advice you can give a client becomes a more uh, becomes a more trouble. And and Janice, you trouble. were concerned by the DOL bullet for precisely this reason, or for the more general sort of. Well, I, I mean, I, you know, I think the, I, I don't have any problem with the idea that it can't be for, you know, purely collateral purposes, but it is the, it, it appears to me, and I've read, I think all, well, I've read as many of them, I don't know if I've read all of them, um, but, um, but it appears to me this is an, an, a narrowing or a tightening in a way in which um, it's taking aim at things like um, proxy efforts and uh, governance uh, efforts that some of the pension funds are doing um, in a way that you can't, justify that activity or expenditure of that activity, which, you know, if we think about good sort of investment strategy, it's not just investment. It is, you know, shareholder activism. It is governance intervention with boards where possible. It's a range of strategies that actually shift the trajectory of decision making. And I think most people in the room would agree with that. And so this bulletin bothered me because it actually is a narrowing of the capacity to do that. And so what it does is it shifts it back to this more unilateral rule about investment decision. So we'll have some people from BlackRock, they can speak for themselves, but they're going to double their engagement team. Are they in legal trouble because of this DOL? Well, I, don't, I can't speak for U.S. law, so. <laughs> Ron, Ron, when you look at the, when you look at the you know, Max's discussion and focus on the ERISA trustee, You've been, you've been in the camp on corporate law fiduciary duties that, that there should be uh, less discretion rather than more, no, not less discretion on oh. business decisions, but certainly, uh, well, let me just ask this question straightforwardly. If the proposal is to change the fiduciary duty of ERISA trustees from the sole interest standard to the best interest standard, are you in favor or against? Trustees are interesting. Um, trust, the, um, the trustee issue raises an issue of who's monitoring the trustees in a way that isn't the case on the, on the um, corporate side, mm -hmm. and where the massive shift in the distribution of ownership on the corporate side that's taken place the last 10 years uh, changes that even more dramatically. Uh, the other part of it, though, is in, on the fiduciary side is we keep sliding back between um, 401k plans on the mm -hmm. one hand and yep. people like CalPERS yes. or the Quebec fund. Yes. I, and I just, the distinction I wanted to, I want to draw is between uh, funds that actually have to compete for the money and funds like CalPERS who can, uh, uh, who have uh, locked in beneficiaries, and they don't have any choice about what they invest in. They mm -hmm. have, if you want an example of the single worst governance arrangement you could imagine, it would be great. It would be a great uh, exam question. Look at Calper's governance. Um, so the sliding sliding from one to the other um, generates a uh, generates a, a, a bunch of a, a bunch of messy a bunch of messy things and on the calpers uh, example of locked in beneficiaries locked in beneficiaries uh, selection of a governing board mm -hmm. 
um, that makes uh, that makes no sense, no accountability, and the capacity to adopt returns to re adopt uh, returns. The, the, most recently, they did a good thing, but but to adopt assumptions about returns that keep cities from going bankrupt at the expense of the exp at the expense of the beneficiaries. Um, it's about as bad as I think you can get, and uh, but politically, it's not going to change. Max, you want to jump in here? Well, I, I would say that, the, that Ron's pointing out a really important distinction, which is between uh, 401k, where you're allowed menu, where it's about menu construction. And there, you know, my view is these days you, you really have to offer some passive funds, some low fee passive funds. And there's, that's what a lot of the litigation is about. Have you failed to do that? Have you gone to the, But can you offer ESG funds? Can you offer socially responsible funds, even if they have, you know, collateral benefits attached to them? I think you can. I, I don't have, because as long as there's disclosure and the beneficiaries are really making the choice, and as Ron said, you can move between funds and there's lots of evidence capital does flow out of underperforming funds and towards performing funds. Uh, and so the agency is vested a lot with, more with the beneficiaries than a CalPERS is where you are locked in. I would not remove the sole benefit rule in those contexts. And I certainly wouldn't remove it in the case of personal trusts. Uh, but. You, you, we should remember that in personal trust, the sole interest rule is tempered by beneficiary authorization and by settler authorization in certain ways. It's not uncomplicated and it doesn't work in every circumstance, but you can temper it. And so one thing that I would be willing to contemplate is a mechanism whereby people within CalPERS could elect between different investment strategies, one that's socially, you know. But but that would be better than letting the CalPERS fiduciaries, I think, uh, do that given their political uh, appointee, uh, given all of the issues that, that, uh, that Ron raised. Thank you. This, this has been a, a wonderful opening discussion. I think as we move forward into the next two sessions, it seems to me there are a couple of takeaways from this discussion. One is, is the observation that the duties of the investment fiduciaries may be quite different than the duties of directors. The second thing that's clear from outside of the ESG world is that right now, the duties, the flexibility that corporate boards have under traditional fiduciary duty analysis in the corporate sector may not matter very much if the shareholders are focused purely on increasing share value because with, active, with activist shareholders out there, uh, the discretion of the board to balance different concerns, including ESG concerns, will be sharply, will be sharply constrained. And finally, that as in, the, as in the corporate law space more generally, so in the ESG space, much of the action is on, is on the side of the investors, is trying to figure out what the investors' duties are, what they're, how, to, how to motivate them in the ways that we choose, we decide we want to motivate them, because ultimately, board, in a world of active shareholders, board discretion, while nice in terms of liability protection for directors, uh, may not get you very far and where you're going. So please join me in thanking our panel and we will then have a break.